So the last thing we got to talk about in this unit is gravitational fields, gravitational field strength. Okay, uh, gravitational field is something like if you watch a lot of science fiction movies, they always talk about oh, getting trapped in the gravitational field of this thing or that thing or whatever. Okay, well, gravitational a gravitational field is the area of influence that an, a heavy object may have. All right, so the Earth's gravitational field extends out a really long way from the Earth. Okay. Anything that encounters that gravitational field will be attracted to the Earth by the Earth's gravitational influence. All right, everyone kind of with me there. Now, gravitational field strength is dependent on two things. The mass of the object generating the field and what do you suppose the other thing is? Yes, how close to it you are. Okay, It's affected by essentially the same things as the force of gravity is affected by. But gravitational field strength and the force of gravity are two different things. I'm going to say that again because this is the mistake people make on the unit exam all the time. Gravitational field strength and the force of gravity are two different things. The force of gravity tells us how strongly two objects are attracted to each other by describing the force pulling them together. Gravitational field strength tells us the rate at which they accelerate toward each other. All right, so it would be like describing my weight and ex and describing the acceleration due to gravity. While acceleration due to gravity can affect my weight, okay, they aren't the same thing. Everybody, follow me there. Okay, so that's the exact relationship that we're going to be looking at here. Gravitational field strength is how is the rate at which two objects attract to each other versus the force attracting them together. All right, so gravity is a field. Okay, gravity is a field force. It's the only field force that we talk about in physics 20. In physics 30, there's an entire unit. It's one of the longest ones on forces and fields. And that's where you'll talk about electrical fields and magnetic fields and all types of field forces. Okay, The idea of a field force is important because before we came up with this idea, we had to have invisible massless strings that attached everything together. Okay, Because that's how forces that acted over a distance without being in physical contact with each other worked in people's minds anyway. Okay, it was always this invisible this, this invisible that, okay, because you couldn't see it and they weren't actually touching, but they had to be there, right? In fact, fields are just areas over which forces can act, right? So the Earth has a gravitational field because it is massive, okay? The Sun has an even larger gravitational field because it is even more massive, okay? So the bigger something is, the greater its gravitational field would be, like a black hole would have a giant gravitational field. Okay? And the closer you got to it, the stronger that field would become. Okay, To the point where when you cross the event horizon, you would probably be moving at the speed of light. Okay, Or maybe even faster. That's where theoretical physics takes over. Okay? Because the strength of the gravitational field would be accelerating you so rapidly. Okay? Everyone kind of follow there? All right, so we got to look at gravitational field strength can be is kind of a description of and thus is numerically equal to acceleration due to gravity at a certain point, right? So essentially what we do for gravitational field strength is this. We say that the force of gravity equals the force of gravity. And you're probably going, oh, that's the dumbest thing you've ever written on the board, Coderre. So far, okay? All right. What I'm saying is this, m times g equals big G times mass 1 times mass 2 over r squared. Okay, Which mass is this? Mass 1 or 2? It really doesn't matter, but as long as it's one of them. okay, I'm going to say it's mass 2. Is it the bigger or the smaller one? It's the smaller one. Okay, It's the smaller one because all things fall at the same rate. Okay, gravitational field strength is the rate at which things fall, okay, and that is independent of the mass of the falling object. It is, however, dependent on the mass of the object generating the gravitational field. All right, so what we do here is we manipulate for g. Okay, that's the gravitational field strength. So really, all that happens here is that mass 2, the falling mass, 
cancels. And there's our formula for gravitational field strength. Okay, It's very similar to what we've been using all along. It's just that we've canceled the falling mass. All right. So acceleration due to gravity is, as we said before, dependent on exactly the same things that the force of gravity is dependent on. Okay, It's dependent on the object generating the field's mass and how far from it we are. Okay, Because obviously the further from the Earth we get, the less we're attracted to it. All right, everybody okay with that idea? Okay, so that formula is on your formula sheet and it solves for gravitational field strength. All right, so this idea of fields was developed by Michael Faraday. Okay, he's best known for his work with magnets and, ele and electricity, but okay, he's the one who figured out that magnets and uh, electric currents could exert forces over distances without being in contact with things. He discovered the idea of the field and then it was applied to gravity later. Okay. Uh, so the, the initial idea, though, was that the Earth and the Moon were connected by invisible strings, okay, and that that's what kept the Moon orbiting around the Earth, was that it couldn't let go, okay, there was this invisible string. Obviously, that's ridiculous now, okay, um, but they do have an interacting force between them, right, that's that force of gravity we were talking about, the mutual attractive force between them, but because the Earth is so much more massive than the moon, we don't really notice its movement. It has way more inertia than the moon does, okay? So we don't really see its movement per se as we as we notice the moons, okay? So there's this attraction between them that causes an acceleration to happen, okay? That acceleration in this case acts as a centripetal acceleration because obviously the moon is orbiting the earth. Okay. Everyone all right with that idea there? Okay, so um, Faraday's the guy that came up with this. Okay, he invented this idea the, of the field to explain how a magnet attracted objects. He he basically did that thing you might have done in like fifth grade science, where you had put the bar magnet and then you sprinkled the iron filings around it, and it would make the shape of the magnetic field, okay. kind of like a circle. The Earth's magnetic field looks exactly the same as that. The Earth's like a big bar magnet, okay, and so the magnetic field kind of goes around like this. Okay, kind of comes it comes out of the poles and does does this. Okay, um, the gravitational field obviously doesn't look like that. The gravitational field is more of an ellipse. Okay, um, because of the shape of the Earth. So anything that enters the Earth's gravitational field will be influenced by the Earth's gravity. Okay, altering its path. Right, that's not a big deal most of the time because most things are moving pretty quickly. They might be slightly altered on their path, but they'll pass by the Earth safely. Other times, okay, things that are traveling through space might be significantly altered and attracted to the Earth, and which means they might what? They might hit it, okay? And that's happened in the past, right? What we have to do, okay, is not only look at the Earth's gravitational field, we have to look at the gravitational field of everything in our solar system if we're going to determine what kinds of dangers there might be in terms of getting hit by errant space rocks, okay? In fact, there's a whole program run by the various world space agencies that is doing this all the time. It's called NEO, Near Earth Objects, okay, the Near NEO program. So it's always tracking any anything it can spot, okay, moving through our solar system, it tracks, and it watches its path and tries to predict their orbits based on how the gravitational fields of the various bodies in our solar system will pull on it. Okay, so they're using the same calculation that we're going to be using today to calculate how much the path of these objects would be changed and then re-predict their path. All right? For example, in 2030, I think it's 2030 or 2029, we're going to have a very close encounter with a large asteroid that has been nicknamed Apophis. Okay? It is going to come closer to the Earth than the Moon. Okay? And it's large. Right? Now, there's a bunch of doomsdayers out there that say it's going to hit the Earth and that'll be the end of all things. But it's the, the predicted path right now is showing close, but not close enough. Okay, It's going to pass inside the moon's orbit. That's pretty close. Astronomically speaking, pretty close. Okay, But it's not going to hit the Earth. Okay, Yeah, um, there's, there's tons of, you, know, you can watch it on YouTube, there's tons of crazy people saying how it's going to end the Earth, uh, but it won't. Um, it's it's going to come close, but not hit us. And we're looking at things like that. We need to track them all the time so that we can prepare or get ready and things like that. 
you may be able to see it. Yeah, sometimes when they pass that closely, if they're big enough, you see them, okay? Um, and, and sometimes, obviously, ones that we don't even know about, they hit the Earth's atmosphere and they can be significant, right? You sometimes see a big fireball in the sky, okay? Uh, we had that one over Russia a couple of years ago, okay, that exploded and it broke a bunch of windows, okay, and deafened a bunch of people, actually, the, the concussive force of the explosion, okay, uh, caused a bunch of damage. And then back in, like, 1909, there was one over Russia in Tunguska, Okay, where a big big meteor exploded and it flattened like huge tracts of forest. Okay, luckily there was nobody living in the area at the time, but there's just this path of destruction. Okay, still to this day where that happened. Um, so that that happens occasionally. We don't catch everything, right? An object that can cause that much damage isn't astronomically large. It's actually quite small, right? Um, so we don't catch obviously everything. Okay, we would worry about ones that are big enough to cause a lot of damage. Small, let's say anything smaller than 100 meters. Okay, yeah, I know that doesn't seem, but I mean, stuff, something 100 meters in size hits the Earth's atmosphere, it burns up. It's going to burn up before it gets to the ground. Okay, um, you know, it, the, the worry is that if it's made of certain types of materials, it may not burn up all the way, or there may be gases trapped inside. And when those gases get superheated, that's when they can explode. And that's what happened over Russia twice, okay, is the, the gases inside the asteroid got superheated enough that it blew up. And that's what caused all the concussive damage. And it didn't actually strike the ground. It blew up in the air. So like the one that's just like the mirror, how mm -hmm. big is that? I can't remember how big it is, but it's big. It's like the size of a mountain, like our city. It's big, okay? Uh, so if it were to hit the Earth, it would be significant, okay? It's not going to. Don't have to worry. Okay, don't stress. Okay, it, but it's big. Okay. Have we like ever done anything with ten thousand? No, we haven't because we would. I mean, we we have enough time. Like if we're we're tracking like this asteroid Apophis's orbit, you know, and we would have time to maybe try something. But in the end, there's a lot of technological leaps that would have to be overcome, um, and we'd have to know the orbit pretty well, and we would only be able to do something to it at essentially the very last minute, okay? It's a long way away right now, uh, but we would only really be able to do anything about it when it was much, much closer. Um, you, like a lot of people, you know, all the doomsday movies, so we'll shoot nuclear missiles at it and we'll do this and we'll do that. And um, the issue with that is that a nuclear weapon doesn't have the same effect in space that it does on Earth, okay? Um, it's not gonna, if you blow it up, you know, it hits the asteroid, sure, maybe it causes some damage to the asteroid, but you're only hitting the surface of it. Um, it doesn't have the same concussive force because there's no air to move, right? That's part of the damage. Um, so what they would be looking more at would be altering the trajectory by having something land on it and then engage an engine that pushes, okay? And we don't have to move it very much. It's not like we have to push it a long way. We only have to change its course by half a degree and it misses the earth by 100,000 miles, right? Um, it's just a matter of getting it there. Right? You basically get one shot at it, you screw it up, everybody dies. Then we're back to the science fiction movies, and then it gets exciting. Um, what would that be the it would depend where it hits, it would depend on what it's made out of, all that kind of stuff. Oh no, it wouldn't knock yet, it wouldn't would knock us out of orbit. Like, you'd have to get hit by, I mean, we've been hit by a Mars sized object and not knocked out of orbit. Um, but it could cause, you know, you know, the, yeah, the extinctions and things like that. It'd be a lot of dust in the air. If it hit in the ocean, cause massive tidal waves, tsunamis and stuff. Yeah. Okay, there. Yeah, I'll just rock you to sleep tonight with that thought. Yeah. Okay, so to find the strength of a gravitational field, essentially we have to put a small body of known mass into that field and measure the force acting on it. And then we can use this formula to calculate that. So essentially what we're doing with this is saying little g equals right g times m1 times m2 over r squared divided by m2, okay? So that's where we got that formula from. We divided by the mass of the falling object or the trapped object, and we got that formula that we talked about a few minutes ago, right? So Earth's gravitational field would look something like this, okay? Greatly simplified, obviously. The length of the arrows represents the magnitude of the gravitational field, so how strong it is, and they all point where? Towards the center. Okay. They all point towards the Earth's center because that's where the center of the field emanates from. 
Is it that simple? No, Earth's not perfectly round, okay? And Earth's mass is not evenly distributed either, okay? There are gonna be pockets on the Earth where there's gonna be a little more mass than others, and so there's gonna be a little more gravitational field strength in different places. Not enough that we would notice it, but if you had, you know, uh, sensitive enough equipment, you you could notice that certain places on Earth might have stronger gravitational field strengths just due to how much mass is in one place versus another, okay? Now, it can get even a little bit more complex when you consider that it's not just the moon that, or sorry, the earth that's here, it's also the moon. And the moon's big, okay? Does its gravitational field affect the earth? Yes, it does, okay? That's why we have the tides. We know that the moon's gravitational field overlaps and encompasses the earth and vice versa. Now, we don't really notice that on Earth. Like, I, you know, when the moon's overhead, I'm like, not like, ooh, I feel pulled toward the moon today. <laughs> it's not doing that, okay? Um, but it certainly does pull on the Earth. And as we get further from the Earth headed toward the moon, there would be a point where I'd be perfectly balanced. I'd be equally attracted to both the moon and the Earth. Obviously, that point is much closer to the moon than it is to the Earth because the moon is so much smaller. But this is what um, people at NASA have to think about if they're trying to launch something towards the moon. Okay, they have to. I mean, they don't they don't aim at the moon. They aim at where the moon's gonna be. Okay, and they know that as they travel through there, the gravitational fields when they overlap are going to cause some vector addition problems for them. Okay, we're gonna need to know. Okay, so you know the the vector of the moon is here, the vector of the Earth is here, the net gravitational field strength at this point is gonna be this many uh, meters per second squared. That's gonna alter the course of our spacecraft by this much. We need to account for that. Okay, that's where all that astro astrodynamic stuff comes in. Okay, where these guys really have to think about all those forces and fields and, and things like that. Okay, um, and then obviously as you got closer to the moon, you'd be attracted to the moon. So that would have been an issue when landing on the moon, knowing that uh, you know I don't want to be accelerating towards the moon the whole time using my engines because there's going to come a point where I'm going to be gravitationally accelerated towards the moon, and I don't want to be going too fast. No, we haven't had any issues with like we missed the target. It's more the loss of the craft due to some failure of the craft or some, um, you know, something that caused essentially the craft to fail and then it crashed. Okay, so especially with like the moon and Mars and stuff like that, it wasn't that they missed, it's that they, and when they were trying to land it, something went wrong. Yeah. All right, everybody with me on that? Okay, so we can picture the uh, gravitational field of the Earth as, again, these collection of vectors. The further away we get from the Earth, the smaller the, the magnitude of those vectors is, but they're always going to point towards the center of the Earth. All right, so we're going to go over a couple of examples. Not really much else to say. Gravitational field strength is the gravitational acceleration of an object okay, uh, towards the other. All right, so we're going to calculate the magnitude of the gravitational acceleration of an object at the equator on the surface of the Earth and on the equator on the surface of the Moon. Okay, and we're going to calculate the gravitational field strength in those two locations. All right, so if I'm standing here on the Earth, I want to calculate gravitational field strength. So that's going to mean little g equals big G times the mass of the Earth over r squared. Simple formula. I don't have to manipulate it. I'm just plugging in. So 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11 times 5.98 times 10 to the 24 divided by 6.37. Actually, I think they say it's 6.38 on here, but we're going to use our numbers times 10 to the 6 squared. That is the most common mistake, again, that's made on gravitational field strength problems. People forget to square the radius here. Okay, so if I do that, okay, so I'm getting nine point eight three meters per second squared, or also. Newtons per kilogram could be either one of the units, okay? You think about it, we drew this, we had this formula a minute ago, it was force of gravity 
divided by mass. Okay, and then I plugged in that other formula. This is Newtons divided by kilograms, right? Well, a Newton per kilogram is still a meter per second squared. Okay, you do the math, but either one is, is acceptable. All right, so we got 9.83, okay, meters per second squared, okay, um, for that. Now, if we do that for the moon, what do I change? Mass and radius, because the moon is much smaller. All right, so if I'm calculating this for the moon, then we have G on the moon will be uh, 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11 times 7.36 times 10 to the 22. That's the mass of the moon. Okay, divided by, I can't remember the radius of the moon now. Drawing a blank. Oh, Earth's moon, 1.74 times 10 to the 6. Okay, so on the moon at the equator, I would have a gravitational field strength of 1.62 meters per second squared. Roughly one sixth of Earth, okay? Um, which is significant, right? It created a problem for the astronauts. They had to learn how to walk when on the moon because when they tried to walk like they do on Earth, they found that they were popping up Okay? and that there was a danger that they would fall because they would go too high and lose their balance or start to rotate. Okay, And obviously they didn't want to do that. So that's why you see oftentimes in moon landing videos that the astronauts shuffled a lot. Okay, They shuffled along because they were trying to direct more horizontal movement as opposed to upwards and that that worked better for them. Or they did like a bunny hop kind of a thing. Okay, Yeah, and they called it the Mars bunny hop and that's how they would move along. If they wanted to move fast, that's how they would move. They didn't want to run Okay, because running produces too much upward movement and they would again start to rotate and fall. Okay, so they actually had to learn how to properly move okay, when there. All right, is that a pretty easy formula to use? Okay, it's a really easy formula to use. It's a really easy question on your unit exam, provided you do the question the right way. Every semester when I put a gravitational field strength question on the unit exam, I put in there, calculate the and then I put in boldface, italicized, underlined font, gravitational field strength at whatever location I'm talking about. And one third of people inevitably calculate the force of gravity. Even though it says specifically not to do that. It says calculate the gravitational field strength. Please read the questions carefully. It's an easy, easy question and you don't want to do it wrong. Okay. Everybody got me? Don't do it wrong. Make me wrong. I want it to be less than one third. Please. Possibly. I mean, I'm saying it's a gravitational field strength question. I just inevitably have people who don't solve it as a gravitational field strength question, and then they get it wrong as a result. Okay. All right. But like I said, guys, the big thing here is that people forget to square this. Should you realize you've forgotten to square it when your calculator spits out your answer? Yes. Yeah, if I'm talking about a place on Earth and you forget to square this number, do you get a ridiculously large number? Yes. Yeah, so you know when it should be something around 9.8 and you're getting several hundred thousand, you might have done something wrong, okay? Always make sure your answer makes sense. Okay, um, I want you guys to try these ones. They're gravitational field strength questions. They're pretty straightforward. I'll just make them big enough that you can actually read them. Okay, so let's try one and two for now okay, and see how we do with that, okay? All right, so we'll use the data from your data sheet for that one. And same with this one. Yes. 
radii, radii. Okay, so for 1b, it's wanting to know the gravitational acceleration. So that's gravitational field strength, okay, of this satellite. So that's g equals big G. We're talking about the Earth, so it's mass of the Earth r over r squared. Okay, and we're told here that it's three Earth radii above the surface, so that means it's four for r. Okay, so then it's just going to be um, g will equal 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11 times 5.98 times 10 to the 24. And then we'll have 4 times 6.37 times 10 to the 6 squared. Yeah. And their number's slightly different, so your number might be slightly off of what they have. Okay. 6.11 times 10 to the minus 1 meters per second squared. You want to see it punched into the calculator? No? Good? All right, how many people are done number two? Okay, do we need to go over that one? Yay, nay. No? Okay. All right, we'll keep going on uh, two and three then. All right, so for number three here, okay, they are asking for the gravitational force, not the field strength. That's why you got to read it carefully, and this is what will happen on your unit exam. You have to read the question carefully. So they want to know what's the force of gravity Okay, between these two objects. That means that formula. So it's a 70 kilogram astronaut. We're talking about the Earth and we're 6.6 .6 Earth radii from the Earth's center. Okay, um, so we've got 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11 times 5.98 times 10 to the 24 times 70 kilograms divided by 6.6 .6 times 6.37 times 10 to the 6 squared. Okay, that's the kicker. We have to read it carefully so we know what the question is really asking for, okay, because that's exactly what could happen on an assignment or a test, okay, where I'm telling you, you know, first calculate force, then calculate strength, then calculate force, then calculate field strength, okay, you got to be going back and forth and knowing which one you're being asked for. All right, questions on how that works? Okay, so I want you to practice a couple here out of the workbook. Uh, nothing terribly difficult. Okay, so we're looking at gravitational fields right below the satellite stuff we did yesterday. Okay, try those. <laughs> 